Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to this session, um, which is focused on biofuels. Uh, and so, terrific. Just in the nick of time, right? Okay, our, our first speaker up is, is uh, Robert Kozak, who is the founder and board member of Advanced Biofuels USA. And you, you can speak from either there or the podium, okay? This way I can duck when you start throwing shoes or something. Um, see, we didn't have the crowd here we had for previous speakers, which I think kind of reflects the whole problem of biofuels right now, uh, that we don't seem to be a part of the all of the above discussion. Uh, I'd just like to I have a speech written here, and I'm not sure if I'm going to give what I wrote, but I'd just like to make a few comments that probably are going to be I know everybody wants to be in a positive mood today and everybody working together, but I would like to take sort of a different approach where I think it's a more realistic approach. And as I said, the topic here was all the above is not the solution. And what I'd like to argue, well, let's start at the beginning. I'd first like to say it doesn't surprise me that we have an administration that now has come up with the all the above, so-called all the above policy. And I think we've forgotten why we were doing renewable fuels, why there was, why we were doing renewable. Not alternative, not clean, not green. Why were we doing renewables? And it was something called climate change. Remember greenhouse gases? As was pointed out this morning by one of the representatives, we've hit a record level of CO2 in the atmosphere that hasn't been seen for, Lord knows, I think it's over 60 million years. So that's what we're here about. But then you look at what's been going on in this country, the, the polling. In 2007, a Harris poll found that 71% of Americans thought that human activity, burning a fossil fuel, contributed to climate change. By 2009, the figure dropped to 51%. In 2011, in the same polling, only 44% of Americans thought that the burning of fossil fuels contributed to climate change. So it doesn't really surprise me that we have an administration that has come up with an energy policy that's called all of the above. Now, what is all of the above pol policy is? Well, let's look at it. All of the above is not a policy at all. What all of the above is, it's an acceptance of the energy status quo. So when we say all of the above, it means natural gas. It means deep drilling oil. It means fracking natural gas. It means so-called clean coal. Is there a place for biofuels in there? Well, we certainly hope so. But given the fact that, as I said, it's acceptance of the energy status quo, it means it favors the parties that are at, they're behind the status quo. And if you think about how much money is involved in the energy market, those are the people that are going to try to keep the status quo the way we are. So what is the energy status quo? Still, you hear all these great things about domestic fuel. Right now, 51% of our oil is still imported. We got that 51%, not 25%, not 10. 51% of our oil is still imported into this country. That's what the status quo means. The status quo means a continuation of fracking to produce natural gases. So, I could go and talk about some of the good things. I hope I have a minute or two to talk about it. But I think we all have to look at ourselves and ask, why did this happen? Why did we allow a policy called all of the above? And how do we allow terms such as clean, green, sustainable replace the reality that we need, which is renewable? And maybe we all have to look at ourselves and say, how did we let this happen? Those of us that are in policy positions, people who consider themselves viros, people that are on the staff up here on the Hill. How did this happen? Well, maybe we kind of lost our way. Maybe we thought that by growing vegetables in our backyard and driving a car that has batteries and engines that are made out of rare earth elements that are produced by people in places that quite truthfully do not follow environmental regulations or human rights regulations, maybe we thought that was enough, that if we just do those things for ourselves, maybe that was enough. And therefore, all of the above is fine because, you know, we don't want to get into fights over things, that there are ways to go. 
So I'm just asking everybody should look at themselves and think about what can we do tomorrow to go to a real renewable thing. Just a couple things I want to point out, interesting things that's happening in renewable fuels and associated with that. Say about 10, 15 years ago, everybody thought the internal combustion engine was dead and gone. You know, it's reached its, the end of its life cycle, it's over 100 years old, we can't get any more efficient. What's been happening in the development of the internal combustion engine in the last 10 or 15 years is remarkable. The engines are getting smaller, more efficient, lighter, better mileage. Heck, I mean, you're getting cars out there now that can burn a liquid fuel and get the same mileage as a heavier, more expensive hybrid model. So this, these are the things that should be embraced from my point of view. Uh, we were at a car race last weekend, two weekends ago in Detroit. Indy car races, cars that race at Indy. Those run on E85. These are the most powerful, fastest race cars in the world and they chose E85 for its power. Sports car races, you go to American Le Mans, you go up to Baltimore on Labor Day, you'll see them race, the Ferraris, the Corvettes, the Porsches. They all went to E85 for power. And if you're looking at what's going on now, EPA has recently proposed in Tier 3 to allow up to E30 as a new certification fuel. And the reason that they're proposing this is that the car manufacturers have said we need more octane. We need more power out of the fuel. So EPA is agreeing and say, you're agreeing to a point and saying, yeah, you know, if you're going to meet the fuel economy standards of 2022, you're going to have to use, you know, bioethanol or other biocomponents like that. So I think as we go forward, I think we have to scrap all the above. What we have to do is to look at each sector, and I know a lot of you here are from the electrical sector and not so much from the transportation sector, but I would say forget all the above. Let's look at each, one, each system, be it electrical production, be it manufacturing, be it transportation. Let's look at the most efficient way to get rid of all the greenhouse gases as fast as we can. Not this incremental stuff of 3% per year, 5% per year, or waiting until, you know, the East Coast gets flooded. You know, if we're really serious about this, if we really believe that climate change is the reason that we're doing this, as well as reducing imports for security reasons, if we really believe in that, then let's do it. Let's go all out. Let's find the best pathways. Now, right now, a lot of these pathways have major roadblocks in it. People are familiar with cellulosic ethanol have heard something called about biomass recalcitrance. Well, it's there. It's a roadblock, but it can be overcome with the right science if there's the funding, if, it's, if there are universities and businesses in this country allowed to do it. And, you know, I mean, you've heard people call for an Apollo program or a Manhattan Project program, and I would have to say that if we're really in favor of reducing it, we just can't let all of the above status quo continue. If we're serious, let's do it like we did in Apollo. Let's do it like was done in the Manhattan Project. I mean, like they said, this show has been going on for 16 years. Yes, that's good, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't have had to. It should have been dealt with already. You know, the Manhattan Project lasted, what, three, four years? The Apollo Project lasted eight. I think we can do better. Thanks. Thank you. And I think the exciting thing is in terms of hearing about all the solutions and knowing that they really are absolutely before us and that we're seeing them demonstrated today. Um, we're now going to hear from Ezra Finken, who is the Director of Policy and External Relations with the Diesel Technology Forum. Thank you. Can everyone up? Oh, there we go. Um, Yes, thank you. I'm Ezra Finkin with the Diesel Technology Forum. Our uh, membership represents uh, companies that manufacture engines, uh, diesel engine vehicles and equipment. Uh, you're probably wondering why is diesel here at an energy efficiency renewable, uh, renewable energy uh, meeting. But essentially diesel is the most uh, efficient powertrain out there. Uh, diesel fuel has the highest energy content of any transportation fuel. In fact, petroleum-based diesel and uh, bio-based diesel uh, have a higher energy content to gasoline. Um, gasoline is number three on the list, and uh, petroleum and bio are, are one and two. The diesel engine is one of the most efficient ways of transferring that energy content into power. In fact, that's why you see uh, diesel powering all sorts of heavy-duty conveyances from long-haul trucks, buses, ferries, ambulances, school buses, you name it. Um, diesel is ubiquitous. 
uh, this has gone unnoticed by all sorts of uh, government folks who study the matter. In fact, the National Petroleum Council last summer, uh, in a report to both the President and the, uh, the uh, Secretary of Energy, concluded that in the foreseeable future, diesel will be the uh, powertrain of choice in the heavy-duty world, given its uh, ability to transfer uh, uh, the energy content of fuel into power. Uh, the inherent efficiency of the diesel engine hasn't gone unnoticed by consumers either. It's ubiquitous in the heavy-duty world, and it's growing in popularity in the light-duty sector as well. Uh, you see a lot of diesel cars on the road today, given, um, given their presence from some years ago, and you're going to see a lot more in the future. Uh, consumers that are looking to purchase a car in the next two years and have made up their mind to purchase a diesel have done so overwhelmingly because they recognize the uh, fuel efficiency of the diesel powertrain. In fact, if you go to fueleconomy.gov and, uh, and you look at a diesel-powered uh, car or light-duty truck and you compare that to its gasoline equivalent, depending on the make and model, you no you'll notice that it's about 20 to 40 percent uh, increase in, in fuel economy. So consumers are, uh, are, are, are turning on to, uh, to the diesel powertrain in the light duty market as well. Uh, diesel is also clean. Uh, given the advent of ultra low sulfur diesel in the 2006-2007 time frame, uh, new engine and after treatment technologies uh, were able to be developed and marketed that essentially eliminated the criteria pollutants from, from diesel engines. So what does that mean? So uh, for example, uh, relative to a uh, truck manufactured in 1988, a clean diesel truck that meets 2007 and, and now the, the 2010 uh, engine standards for heavy-duty trucks, those trucks exhibit a 98% reduction in particulate matter and a 98% reduction in certain oxides of nitrogen, which is a, a smog-forming pollutant. And how do you get that? It's, uh, it's the advent of, of the sulfur, the low, the low sulfur diesel fuel, allowing for certain engine technologies like exhaust gas recovery that, that basically recirculate some of the unburned fuel back into the engine for combustion, and other uh, really interesting technologies, diesel particulate filters that essentially scrub the particulate matter from the exhaust and other, and other technologies like uh, selective catalyst reduction um, that essentially injects a little bit of ammonia in the exhaust fluid to um, turn the, uh, the uh, nitrogen dioxide into just raw nitrogen inerts around us and, uh, and water. So I don't want to get into those technologies, but we have a booth here, and uh, if you're interested, please feel, fr feel free to stop by our booth, and, uh, and we'll, we'll tell you about all those cool technologies that are around. Um, also, the catch here with renewables is uh, uh, all of our uh, uh, members manufacture uh, engines and equipment that are capable of running on biodiesel. I don't want to steal Ann's thunder there. Um, but just a quick note there, um, you know, biodiesel is considered an advanced biodiesel, has a capability of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50 percent. And all of our, uh, all of our members manufacture equipment um, that is capable of running on certain blends of biodiesel. Typically in the heavy duty, the, you know, the big long haul trucks, the heavy duty sector, uh, most, uh, most manufacturers are capable of, uh, of, that equipment is capable of running on a blend of about 20 percent biodiesel or B20. In the light duty car segment um, and light duty truck segment, uh, typically uh, they're approved to run on a blend of uh, 5 percent or B5. In fact, some manufacturers are approving uh, some cars and light trucks to run on a, on a B20 blend. So diesel is, uh, is clean, renewable, uh, and, and very efficient. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, what's happening in Europe, you can definitely see the nexus between all three of that. You know, uh, the car segment in, uh, in Europe has one of the strictest emission standards for both criteria pollutants and greenhouse gas or carbon uh, reductions, and those have been in place for some years now. And as those, uh, as those standards get stricter and stricter and stricter, the share of the uh, car segment, the diesel share of the car segment keeps going up because uh, manufacturers can realize they can meet these strict uh, uh, emissions, uh, strict emission reduction requirements uh, by refining the diesel powertrain to essentially eliminate a lot of the a lot of the uh, the criteria pollutants and meet some of these greenhouse uh, greenhouse gas and or 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 carbon carbon requirements. Um, I think it's really important to know that as we look at everything across every economic sector, improving the efficiency of everything that we do is critical if we're going to um, be able to replace um, uh, fossil fuels in, in terms of, of the main 
um, energy resource used in the country. We simply must improve our efficiency overall. And, um, and diesel is looking at, at clean diesel and the whole world biodiesel is, is an important way to accomplish that in the transport sector. So we're now going to turn to Dr. Robert Doe, is that correct? Um, who's the president and CEO of Selena Fuels Corporation. And this is a company that has done some very, very interesting projects. Dr. Doe. Uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit different about the certain part of the transportation that uh, most people don't think about. And uh, because a lot of people, when you talk about transportation, we think of cars. And uh, we brought up a lot of solutions to increase, you know, the mileage and looking at hybrid or look at electric technology. But the, the partners of ours, the airlines, which is the key large transport industries, which all of us use a lot, um, have a different problems. And they would be here, they have a chance, they would present this, that they can't go hybrid and they can't go electric. So they're going to need liquid fuels for many, many years, even if they all eventually buy a Dreamliner, which is going to give them better safety. They will need jet fuel. And the current challenge in biofuel is that we make ethanol, uh, the first generation of fuel. We make renewable diesel. But these are not stable. I mean, they cannot function in a jet engine. You're flying, you know, at 50,000. You look at your signal, it says minus 50 degrees outside. At minus 50, all this fuel will be frozen. It requires specific kind of fuel that are able for you to fly at that time, a kerosene, or called Jet A1. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, the European Union and all the um, emissions issues of CO2, we talk about climate change, they have implemented carbon tax on jet fuel, as you heard. Any plane that has to fly in and out of Europe has to pay carbon tax. And you look at an airline like our airline partner, like British Airways, they burn a billion gallon of jet fuel a year just at Heathrow. And that's 18 million tons of CO2. They have to pay 300,000, I mean, million dollars a year in carbon tax. Well, where does that money go? It goes to you. You are paying the carbon tax. So. There is a legislation issue right now, and now every airline in the world is making a commitment to IATA to reduce their carbon footprint. By 2020, which is only eight, seven years from now, they have to be carbon neutral. In an industry that grows 5% a year to 10% a year in China, that's a massive amount of jet fuel to go carbon neutral. And they can't go carbon neutral except for bio jet fuel. And suddenly, within the last three to four years, the largest market demand for renewable biofuel are the airlines. They have a legislative-driven process with the carbon tax. They have a demand for you know greener market from all of us. We want to fly, uh, decrease our carbon footprint. And thirdly, it's the price of oil. Fifty percent of the cost of airlines right now are their jet fuel costs. And, you know, airlines are going bankrupt because of it. A barrel of jet fuel, for your information, is $130 a barrel, $30 more than crude oil. So you think of crude oil is $100, jet fuel is $130. So, and that's going to continue to go up. We all know that oil is not going to go down in pricing. So now we have the problems, and the airlines are facing these massive problems. Costs, volatility, oil price, and it's all affecting us. So, and they want biojet fuel. And we can't make biojet fuel from growing corns anymore. Or we have to grow to the next generation. The, the, and the solution, and you look at what the airlines are doing, you see Delta, last year, one of the largest airlines in the U.S., they went out and bought a refinery. I mean, it's unheard of that you have an airline that goes out and go into the oil business to refine oil, but why they need to have control of their source of biojet? Well, jet, because they're just a ref regular refinery. They don't go for a bio greener product. So what are the other airlines are doing? Well, the other airlines came to a solution provider, which is Solena, and now we are partner with all the largest airlines in Europe, British Airways, Lufthansa, Scandinavian Airlines, as well as airline in the U.S., so we're working with American Airlines, United Airlines, 
FedEx JetBlue in order to develop and build what we call an integrated biojet fuel facility utilizing a very well-known technology called the Fisher Tropes technology. We have a stand out there. You can come and, and see how the technology work a little bit more detail. But it's a technology that's been developed in the market for 30, 40 years during you know, World War II, where coal is taken to gasify it into synthetic gas, and then synthetic gas would pressurize it and liquefy it into kerosene. The Germans are doing it in World War II. The South Africans are doing it now with coal because they have no oil resources. So they are making jets. So any airline that flies into South Africa flying out with this product, it's a product that's well demonstrated that it works at minus 50 degrees. It meets all the standards. And what we have done is we take that same process but integrate it with a process that use high temperature plasma gasification that we can take renewable source of carbon, which is waste product, so household waste, commercial waste, or agricultural waste, or forestry waste, and then we gasify it into synthetic gas, and then from there we make biojet fuel, which is chemically equivalent to jet fuel. And under that process, we're rolling out our projects. Our first flagship project is in London, and it will make 3,000 barrels a day. Um, in the parlance of, of refinery, it's very small, but you know, it's a half a billion dollar project. And British Airways is a partner with us and would be the first commercial biojet fuel plant in the world. After that, we're building it in Berlin for Lufthansa. We're working with FedEx to build one in Indianapolis, with American Airlines and United to build it in California. And what we hope is to get the policy in place with the government so we can provide our U.S. government the capacity to buy biojet fuel. The key to the solution that we have here is feedstock. We are using waste feedstock, so therefore it's a cheap feedstock. F feedstock makes up 85% of the cost of biofuel. So if you grow corn, the cost of corn is going to go up It's because ethanol is very expensive. So the U.S. has to put subsidies for ethanol because the cost of the feedstock. By utilizing a waste feedstock, we get it for free, and most of the time we get paid to take it. And that gives us a huge competitive edge, would allow us to make jet biojet at a lower price in oil, because oils continue to go up because of the cartel, whereby we can have a feedstock sources that are stable, and it gives the airline the stability and less volatility in their, in their hedging pricing of oil. So um, that's what we hope to roll out into the uh, jet fuel market. I hope that you would learn more and talk to your policymaker about developing and policies in place to support it, because this technology is rolling out on the commercial side. But as you know, the U U.S. government and the DOD is continuing to buy fuel at $30 a, a gallon, and there's to be a gap. And the policy change will come from, from you, who's going to influence your Congress and your members about understanding the need for biojet fuel. Um, and uh, like I said, we are out there in the stand next to the podium. Come and ask us for more questions. Thank you very much. It, thank you. And, and I think that it's important to, to also remember that there are a lot of different kinds of feedstocks and a lot of different kinds of fuels that are appropriate in terms of different applications because, again, there isn't just uh, one solution for everything. And indeed, one of the great wonders is that there are so many different kinds of renewable resources and applications that can fit all of the different needs that we have in our very complex economy. So we're now going to turn to Ann Steckel, who is the Vice President of Federal Affairs with the National Biodiesel Board. Ann? Well, thanks, Carol. It's great to be here with everyone today. Uh, as Carol said, I'm Ann Steckel with the National Biodiesel Board. And for those of you that don't know, the National Biodiesel Board is the trade association that represents the biodiesel industry. The biodiesel industry has about 200 plants in just about every state in the country. Uh, we use a variety of feedstocks to make up biodiesel. Biodiesel is a diesel replacement uh, and also an enhancement. 
Um, we use recycled restaurant grease. We use soybean oil. We use canola oil. We use camelina oil. We can use algae. Uh, we use animal fats. So we really are able to take a lot of these waste products, um, treat them under strict uh, ASTM technical standards, and th turn them into a fuel. Um, so this, is, this has been a real value-added benefit for our industry. Um, we are, as Ezra said, an advanced biofuel, which means we reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50 percent. And depending on which feedstock we use, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions compared to petroleum by up to 87 percent. Um, and EPA went through, uh, when they put in the renewable fuel standard into place, designating which fuels were qualified as which. Uh, and so EPA has designated us as an advanced biofuel. As Ezra said, there are, uh, there's many benefits to biodiesel, uh, and certainly greenhouse gas emissions is one of them, but obviously having a variety of feedstocks is another one of those. Uh, and clearly lessening our dependence on foreign oil is, is clearly one of the foremost foundations for the benefit of our industry. As I said, we have plants pretty much all across the country. All of our plants are optimized to run on a variety of feedstocks, depending on which feedstocks are less expensive. Uh, and we're developing new feedstock technology as we speak right now. So clearly diversification for our industry is a very important thing. Um, as Ezra also mentioned, um, one issue that we don't have that perhaps other fuels have is that we don't have any issues with running on different kinds of engines. Most major engine manufacturers in the U.S. have warrantied their engines up to a 20 percent blend of biodiesel. Um, so th it's commonly seen across the United States um, that if you use diesel, uh, you can put up to a 5 percent blend of biodiesel in that, and it isn't, it isn't even labeled on the pump. So you may be using biodiesel uh, if you're driving a diesel engine and you don't even know it. So we're, we're certainly a product that's been around for a number of years and continue to grow at a pretty steady pace. Last year we produced about a billion gallons of diesel. Uh, and while we're very proud of this number and it was a huge milestone for our industry, you have to remember that we're blending it into a 60 billion gallon diesel pool. So we're still a very small part of the diesel pool, uh, but we're a very growing, uh, growing industry. We're growing at a very sustainable rate. The renewable fuel standard has been very beneficial to our industry. Uh, the renewable fuel standard for diesel was put into place in 2010. So that was really the first year that we saw biodiesel start to uh, increase its volume level significantly through the renewable fuel standard. Again, we're at a billion gallons last year. Uh, we are looking to be at at least 1.28 billion gallons this year. But because production has been so good, we're looking to hit around 1.6 billion gallons. Again, uh, a milestone for our industry and something that we're very excited about. Uh, so as you guys talk to folks on Capitol Hill or as you're around visiting members of Congress or certainly visiting the Expo, um, please stop by our booth. Uh, mention biodiesel. Uh, it's an issue that we're very proud of. We have a website. It's nbb.org. Uh, please feel free to visit that for more information. Um, and we're, pr we're happy to provide that to you. So in addition to the renewable fuel standard, um, our industry has a dollar tax credit. It's a biodiesel incentive. Um, and you were talking about biojet. Biojet actually qualifies for that dollar tax credit as well. So biodiesel, renewable diesel, and biojet all qualify for a dollar tax incentive, which has really um, been very helpful for our industry as we continue to grow out our transportation sector. Um, it's certainly helped with blending facilities, uh, terminal expansion, and things like that. It's allowed some of our plants that have been very small to be able to grow in a really sustainable way. So the tax incentive has really been, in terms of federal policy, very key for us. So as you talk to folks, Folks, please keep that in mind as well. Um, folks talk a lot about uh, tax reform, uh, what's going to happen with tax extenders. We'll have to see how that road goes. Uh, but for our industry, it's been very successful. Um, trying to keep it concise. If you guys have questions later, feel free to ask. Happy to answer. Thank you. And rounding out um, this panel discussion is Steve Wilburn, who is the President and CEO of Firm Green Inc., uh, to talk about yet another kind of biofuel. Well, uh, good afternoon. specializes in biobetting 
projects. Uh, we are right now, my name is Enrique Ruiz, and I'm uh, the business development director, and uh, I live in Puerto Rico, a small island that feels a lot of the effects of, from greenhouse gases and uh, rising uh, sea levels. Uh, you see a lot of places in Puerto Rico now that used to have beautiful beaches, uh, having half of the coastline that they used to have. So definitely very dear to me, all this uh, theme of uh, sustainability and renewable energy. Um, the fuel that we deal with is uh, biogas. Biogas uh, being a source that is uh, all around the world. We see it on the landfills uh, where waste goes, but also uh, in places like Europe with anaerobic digestion, where uh, it's a natural uh, uh, product that comes from the decomposition of organic materials. One of the things that I concentrate being a business development director and being in charge uh, or uh, focus on the part of uh, project development is that uh, uh, renewable energy uh, is a dream that we all have had for a long time, but sometimes the dream has to uh, smack uh, the wall with the reality. And one of the things that I try to talk to all the people all the time, and I like the title of the conference is that renewable has to be sustainable in order to be effective. There's a lot of renewable energy uh, projects and alternatives out there that you see and great ideas, uh, great dreams, but when they are faced with reality, they're not sustainable. And sustainable has to be part of the equation. One of the things that I like from some of the panelists that I heard here, uh, like Dr. Lowe, is that definitely looking at alternatives where you can bring a product that uses a material like waste uh, that today goes to a landfill or goes to uh, some worse places like riverbeds can be used to be you know transformed into a, a product that that's where i think uh, the future of this uh, industry is and one of the projects that are a flagship project right now we're taking the landfill gas from the largest landfill in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, this landfill was subject to a documentary a couple of years back called Wasteland, uh, where a lot of people uh, live off that landfill, just picking up uh, the trash and stuff to make our livelihood. We're taking that landfill now and modernizing a lot of their operation, and we're taking the methane that was uh, just taken going up in the air from that landfill and actually doing a lot of harm not only to the globe in general but the people that were living off the landfill and we're taking that uh, landfill gas we're cleaning it up but we're extracting the methane and we're sending that via pipeline for a petrobras refinery for them to substitute some of the fuels that they use in the refinery operations so that that's one of the uh, i would say uh, beautiful things about the project is that some people never saw the marriage of uh, the renewable or the biofuel guys with refineries because those are the traditional oil and, and, and fuel uh, faults. In this project we're taking right now going online is the largest landfill gas reclamation project just for reference. Typical landfill gas projects flow about uh, 1,000 to a couple thousand uh, cubic feet per meter of gas. We're taking 12,000 cubic per meter of gas and making a uh, renewable biomethane that is being going to be used uh, on the refinery. The beautiful thing about this uh, uh, fuel is that it has applications on the energy sector but also on the transportation sector as well. And that gives a, a broad base uh, uh, of use. I, I was never a, a big uh, fan of uh, waste to energy. Uh, I have been in the waste business also for a long time and I also, I, I saw the energy part being kind of a, a limited uh, solution to the problem. With the fuels, we, you see transportation, you see uh, aviation, we have a very broad uh, market and a very broad uh, effect that we can have uh, displacing uh, dirtier fuels but also enhancing uh, the livelihood of the people that uses this product, you know, this type of products uh, in their cars, in the transportation, uh, you know, public transportation. And not only that, we're taking something that was going today in the air, creating some of the 
methane is 21 percent, uh, 21 times, uh, I'm sorry, uh, more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. So we're taking something that was uh, creating the greenhouse gas effect and now taking it to a market where we're displacing uh, some dirtier fuels. And also uh, uh, one of the vehicles that we used at one time in one of our projects was a fuel fuel vehicle that run a biodiesel with CNG. So it could run a boat. So uh, that's one of the beautiful things about the biofuels market is that everybody thinks about renewable energy and they stay with solar, the wind, and even the light switch of electricity. But the renewable world right now, we are part of it. The biofuels, the advanced fuels are there. The key for our market, for our industry, is the word sustainable. Uh, growing corn for ethanol, and I, I just hope I'm not uh, upsetting anybody, that's not sustainable. Uh, it's the same in some areas with uh, biodiesel. I like what, you know, when they do the reclamation of the oils, but in some cases they went overboard and they did the palm oil in certain areas were not sustainable. So sustainability for the growth of this industry is important because those projects that have not been sustainable usually have a very nice curve that they have a, a big bang uh, because they are subsidized, something like that, but they fall as quick as they went up. So sustainability is the one that gives you the smooth curve where you can grow an industry, grow a market, and actually make a mark for you know years to come. And that's, I think, uh, part of what everybody here has been talking about is making a mark going in a, the renewable market, but in a sustainable way where we can grow. And I uh, invite you to visit us in the booth that we have here in the seating floor. There you can learn a little bit more about our uh, project in Rio de Janeiro. And like I said, it's a beautiful project. We're taking uh, landfill gas and making it into a biofuel uh, that will uh, do a lot of good. Uh, and hopefully uh, other projects of that magnitude will come online. We have some other projects. But, uh, Right now, I think that the future with the biomethane is very bright and we hope to be a very big part of it. Thank you very much. that I had forgotten to write down your name after you told me this story. So anyway, I'm glad that you were all here. And we have a couple minutes if anybody's got any questions. Any questions? Okay, go ahead. I'm Howard Marks, a renewable energy consultant from the Department of Energy. Uh, we've had a flying with the members this week uh, regarding uh, to one of the issues is the future of renewable fuel standard two, and uh, which is under threat right now in the House and the Senate. Uh, if you could please tell us a little bit about what the reaction your members have gotten from uh, members of Congress. Thank you. Sure, happy to touch on that. Uh, as you said, we did have a fly-in this week. We had a one, over 100 members from all across the country come and visit their members of Congress to talk about biodiesel and how biodiesel has been a real success, to st success story for the renewable fuel standard. Um, as I said, we produced over a billion gallons last year. And so this, this fly-in is really an opportunity for our members to touch base with uh, their members of Congress and folks in the administration to talk about while there may be other issues going on with the renewable fuel standard, um, overall it is serving the intention that Congress put in. Uh, and certainly biodiesel is a big part of why that's happening. Biodiesel has filled up over 85 percent of the advanced bucket of the renewable fuel standard. So um, we have certainly met and exceeded all of our, our goals that were well qualified under the renewable fuel standard. Um, clearly we support over 50,000 jobs, so this has been really good for for, um, for the economy, um, obviously energy diversity has been a real um, positive aspect as well. So this, this fly-in was really just an opportunity for folks to talk to their members of Congress. Clearly, Congress is looking at and may potentially be renewing, revamping, uh, or, or opening up potentially the renewable fuel standards. So we just wanted to talk about why we think it's, it's going just fine. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you very, very much, and really appreciate you all being here. And so make sure that you visit everybody over in the expo, and we will start our next panel in just a couple minutes. Thank you.